So my name's Casey. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. I'm super stoked to have you guys here, especially there's so many other good presentations going on, so it really is awesome that you're here to help build up your communication library. Um, so feel free, I'm on Twitter. I just joined Twitter like for these moments specifically. Very exciting. Um, so feel free to at me. Um, and if you have any feedback or anything like that, like I would love it. I love any sort of feedback, any sort of like advice that you might have for me because I have just started doing these presentations this year and I want to continue and keep getting better. So we're gonna be talking about how nonviolent communication can help keep the peace on your team. Um, so real quick about me, I'm Casey. I like reading, drinking wine, board games, cooking, playing music, and uh, I have so many plants now. Um, it's like that vicious cycle of like you buy a cute like planter and then you need, you have like all these like extra pots and then you need more plants and then you have too many plants and you need to keep buying more planters. So that's kind of where I'm at because I just got a house in St. Paul and so I'm filling it up with plants. Um, and at this moment right now in time, I'm a front end dev with uh, SDG, Solution Design Group. So if you have any questions about doing that kind of stuff, um, hit me up, we're always hiring it, it's super fun. Um, and as far as board games go, my favorites right now are Scythe and Root and Gloomhaven. So those are super fun too. Um, so you can at me about any of that stuff. Okay, so the goal of this presentation is just to help you become aware of what nonviolent communication is. Um, and it's something that I think can really help improve your relationships within your family, with your friends, with your coworkers, clients, um, by using, using this compassionate communication. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm just a fan. Uh, so I will not have all the answers for you, but we'll work through it together. I just want you to become aware of this framework that you can apply to your own life. Um, it's not about the physical violence, uh, but verbal violence and harm that can be detrimental to your relationships. Why? Why would you ever want to use this? Because um, it's, it's great. It's, a, it's, you know, it's something that I think can just really improve um, not only your relationships with other people, but it improves your relationship with yourself. Because um, some of the main steps that you take are understanding what your own feelings are, what your own needs are. And so it's actually made me just feel more at peace with myself and understand what I need, what causes my feelings, and, and like the needs that are underneath that. So NVC, um, which I'll probably call it um, for shortening it up for a while, um, it's a framework basically. It's just a skill set that you can add to your library. Um, is that enough like coding, like NPM funds for you? Um, <laughs> so it's just another thing that you can just add. It's not going to be a cure-all. It's not going to work for everybody. You can't have a compassionate communication with somebody that does not care about you. Like if they don't care about your happiness or your needs, it's going to be a one-way kind of thing. You can still do it on your end, but you can't force somebody else to, to engage in this compassionate communication. Um, but it's just something to keep in mind and it's just something, it makes you more aware of what you're saying too. Like words are so important. And I think a lot of us just have like automatic responses to stuff like, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> you know, if you don't really think about like what you're saying or thinking about what the other person is speaking um, and the needs that they are relaying to you, it's just, you can have those habitual automatic responses. So this just makes you think about it a little bit more which can be exhausting, and it can kind of slow down your communication a little bit if you're just like, okay, what am I feeling right now? Like, what is this other person feeling? How do I respond? So it's just something that you practice, um, just another way to start viewing things. Um, so I think I kind of got through all that. Sorry, if anybody hates wordy bullet points, like. I apologize, there's just like so much stuff I want to talk about and I want to make sure like I, if you want these slides I can give them to you and they'll still help. Um, so how, because I want to be able to frame this today to how it can help you at work. Because um, that's why we're all here, we want to make our, our work lives better. Um, so I just read Five Dysfunctions of a Team, has anybody else here read that? It's so good, right? It's so good. I, as soon as I read it, I like came back to my presentation and spruced it up and um, added this in a little bit, uh, just because I think it's it's such a good book. Um, Patrick Lencioni, if anybody else wants to get that, um, 
And so as I was reading that, I was like, oh, I feel like this nonviolent communication can really help with every single step of this process. Um, and so it's the absence of trust. It kind of is a pyramid, and I drew it up, and it's kind of intense. <laughs> okay, So it's the absence of trust, the fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and the inattention to results. And so, you know, you kind of have to work your way up because without trust, there can be no conflict. If you don't trust the people you work with, you don't want to express yourself and, and have that healthy conflict with them because you will feel like either they're attacking you or they'll feel like you're attacking them and they won't really trust, like, your conflicting ideas. It won't be like, they won't see it as for the greater good. It'll feel more like an attack if you don't have that trust. And so the fear of conflict is needed before you can commit to something. Because um, everybody needs to be able to voice their opinion uh, before they're able to commit to something. Uh, even if you, there are disagreements and you think maybe one way is a better way to do something, as long as you're able to be heard, as long as that opinion is able to be made and considered and heard by everybody else, if they decide to go another way, it's a lot easier to commit to that decision if you feel like you were a part of it. Um, avoidance of accountability. If you don't have a strong commitment, you can't be accountable for anything. And so that was kind of very familiar to what we heard earlier this morning, um, where if you don't have those strict guidelines, if you don't have that explicit language, it's like, I need you to do this by this time, how can you ever be accountable for it? Like if they just sort of like, take a look at this um, and get back to me, there's no clear accountability. You can't really be accountable for that. And then inattention to results. Um, so that's just like, you know, if you don't have that accountability, there's no results, and then that's what we're all looking for in the end is those, those final results. So um, I wanted to bring this up first. So as we are talking through the nonviolent communication, you can try to start applying it to these ideas. And also this presentation is best if there is some back and forth, so feel free to interrupt me, raise your hand if you have any ideas of like, oh, this happened to me at work, like what, what, what should I do in this situation? Or like, here's something that happened and here's what I did. I love that stuff. So feel free to, to jump in. All right, back to nonviolent communication. Um, so the four components, the first one is the observation without evaluation, identifying and expressing feelings, taking responsibility for our feelings, which are our needs, um, and then requesting that which would enrich our life. So we're going to kind of go through each of these. So observation without evaluation. It seems like it's like, yeah, observe. Okay, I see that. Um, next. But uh, observing without evaluating is actually super difficult without putting, in pers like impressing your own judgments and your own ideas and values onto what you're observing. And you can note, like, it just happens so easily. Um, so being able to observe without already judging it is a really good skill to have in nonviolent communication, especially towards yourself too. Um, so when we combine observation with evaluation, people are going to hear criticism. So like if I said like, John sucks at soccer, like do you think you maybe get a little bit defensive? Like maybe be like, wow, they are criticizing me, this sucks, like I don't want to work on my skills like they just made me feel really bad or John hasn't scored a goal in 20 games that's like a pure observation I am not impressing any of my values on that maybe he's a better like he's a defenseman maybe he's a goalie and I just have no idea what soccer is <laughs> <laughs> um, you know so it's like if you have to take that um, that personal side of your your judgments out of it and a big part of that especially is like our moralistic judgments like saying like that skirt is too short and it's like that could just be your own judgment you know that's not for you to say you can say like that skirt is shorter than my skirt that would be an observation you're already like especially like in, like already putting on your own judgments to that observation does that make sense and it's like as soon as i learned that i was like Phew. It makes such a huge difference. And identifying and expressing our feelings. I feel like especially um, in the English language, um, in America, we were not brought up to really be in touch with our feelings. It's mushy, it's introverted, it is selfish, you know? Um, and so I feel like, for at least for me, the way that I was brought up was like, 
how do I like just act in accordance with the way everybody else expects me to act? How should I feel right now? Not actually looking inward and trying to figure out how I actually feel. Um, and so this is a hard one. They're all really hard. Um, but this one, you know, you really got to break some strong habits that you might have grown up with to really get in touch with how you feel. And actually, um, and at the speaker dinner, as a couple of us were talking about this last night, um, a lot of times we don't have the words to express like how we feel. Um, in our language, it's, it's, you know, it's hard to come up with the actual word. And if you don't have that um, kind of fortune, like that skill set of the words right there, how do you express like how you're feeling if you don't know what word to use? Um, so like somebody said that when they found out the word hangry, like it totally changed their life because <laughs> that just like was like exactly how they were feeling, but they didn't know how to express it before. And like not being able to express yourselves, that's why toddlers have tantrums, right? Because they just don't know how to express what they're feeling and what they need. Um, and so this is the book that I'm taking everything from. Like, I am not creating this out of my own mind. I am taking it from this book right here, Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg. Um, and actually, the Microsoft CEO gave this to all of his top executives. So this is a very topical thing. It was, but it's a 15-year-old book, but it still really comes in handy today. Um, and in this book, let me see. I don't, I don't think I was smart enough to like, oh, I did. I did blank pages. Um, there's like a whole list of words <laughs> uh, to express how you're feeling. And it's stuff, it's like, instead of saying you, you're good, dig down a little bit further. And it's like, I am happy right now. I am splendid. I am glowing. I am grateful. You know, like those are all different words. We try to say that we have like synonyms in the English language, but we really don't. Each word is a little bit different, right? So it's good to just build up um, that database of words to help you express your feelings and help you figure out your own feelings. Um, and feelings versus thoughts, that's big too, because it's not about how you think you feel, it's how you feel. So it's kind of like, I think, I, I feel like I got ripped off. Like that's not a feeling, that's a thought. Like you feel discouraged, you feel sad, you feel like you have to dig down to what those feelings actually are, what your feelings are, and not how you are interpreting other people's actions on you. Like, I feel like I got taken advantage of. That's how, that's kind of saying like you're in, like thinking already about what the other person is doing instead of actually your feelings. And so here we do resolving conflict right here. Yeah. Yeah. I yes. Like it's not. Exactly. Yeah. And he even says that in the book where he gets down to that granular level where it's like, if I feel is followed by the word like, it's not a feeling. Um, and so that's a really good point. Um, so if allowing ourselves to be vulnerable by expressing those feelings can help resolve conflict. So that kind of comes back to that five dysfunctions of a team, right? Where we need that trust to be able to be vulnerable and express ourselves and that will help us resolve that conflict. So taking responsibility for our feelings. Um, so that's the needs that we have, values, desires that create those feelings. So kind of is like, you know, bubbles up to those things um, and acknowledging the root of our feelings. So <laughs> this one's so embarrassing, but I still tell it because I have to. So has anybody seen A Star is Born? The new one? I saw it. And I was like bawling my eyes out. I was so sad. That poor dog just sitting in front of the garage. Oh, I can't. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. I won't spoil no spoilers, but it was so sad. But I went to it with my boyfriend and we went out to dinner afterwards. And I was still really upset about this freaking movie. And I knew it was the movie that was making me upset. But I didn't want to admit that. And I was like, you know, just trying to be quiet and stoic and and just getting through dinner and then he was like is there something wrong and then like I made up a problem like between us <laughs> like and then we got in like an argument about it and it was horrible but I was just like why am I doing this and then I was like no nope, never mind I'm just still really sad about that movie <laughs> and he's like oh that's no problem like I told that was a really sad movie so <laughs> 
Um, so just acknowledging that kind of stuff and then speaking up about it. Um, and also uh, the stimulus versus the cause. Um, you are in control of your feelings. You are in control of your needs. Um, and so if someone else makes you upset, that's not, that doesn't happen. They are um, maybe stimulating um, an unmet need of yours, but it's your unmet need. And maybe there's just an outside stimulus that, that brings that to the surface, but it's not their fault. So like if they leave dirty dishes in the sink and you're just like, you are the worst, you never do your dishes. Like how awful of a communication is that? Like how is that, how is that other person supposed to respond in a compassionate way that will lead to you both feeling like your needs are met at the end? You're already accusing them. You are saying that they're like lazy. They never do the dishes. Um, and, and the dirty dishes are just a stimulus for what is causing you to act that way. Like for me, I can't have a dirty kitchen. It gives me anxiety. Like it clouds my brain. I feel really uncomfortable. Um, and that's me. And those are my feelings. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me see, feel agitated, anxious. So what I would do in that situation would be like, hey, when I see dirty dishes in the sink, it makes me feel really anxious. And so if you could please do your dishes, that would just help me feel so much better. And so in a person in that situation, if they heard that and they knew that all they had to do to help like ease your anxiety was do their dishes, hopefully they would do that. They would care about you enough that they could do their dishes. They are, they are seeing your vulnerability, you are expressing your needs to them, you're requesting something clearly, um, and uh, you're not accusing them of anything, but you know, like, who wouldn't want to do that for that other person, especially if you care about them, if all you have to do is some dishes. And so the more directly we can connect those feelings to our needs, like I need a clean kitchen, makes me feel calm, um, it is easier for us to like, it, you know, we can express that and then it's easier for that other person to respond compassionately. Um, like I can connect it to work. Uh, there was somebody on my team who's super helpful, super smart. I am a newer developer, so I am a little bit uneasy sometimes in my skills. Um, and when I run into a problem, at first I put it out on Slack being like, hey, is anybody else seeing this issue? Is, is this like a worldwide thing or is this just me? Um, and usually I just want to know if like, if I just need to like rebuild my database or something, if there's been changes, that's what that first question is for. But then there was one guy that was super helpful and he was always like, I'm coming over to help. And I was like, I'm not ready for that. I don't, ah, uh, no. Oh. And I wasn't ready cause I hadn't really just like dissected the problem. So I wasn't ready to receive his help yet. Um, and so after a while, you know, like I would be like, no, I'm fine. I'm just going to look at this. And then after a while I heard in my review, um, that he uh, said to my um, man manager, I was like, well, I, you know, like I always offered her help, but she kind of declined it, so I'm, I've just stopped offering, and she can come to me if she wants help. And I heard that, and I was really bummed out about it because there was just a miscommunication there, and I didn't tell him clearly that I just needed a minute to understand the problem so I can be open and ready to receive that help. Um, and so when I heard that feedback, I didn't go to him clearly and say that because it wasn't connected to his name, but I knew it was him. Um, and so when I did have problems, I made sure to reach out to him specifically and he would come over and help. And then I did say once, I was like, hey, I really appreciate all your help. I do want it. I sometimes just need a few minutes to sit with the problem and uh, dissect it a little bit so I can understand your advice more clearly. And and then ever since then, he has been like one of the first people that comes over and offers to help. And, um, you know, and we have a good conversation about like when he can come over and help me. <laughs> so it's been, it, that was a huge help, just, just kind of having that honest and open communication. And then the last one is requesting that which would enrich our life. And I think, again, it's kind of, it feels selfish. It feels wrong being like, this is what I need. This is what I want. This is what's going to make my life better. But if you don't do that, then you're kind of like a silent martyr and you're like, I didn't even want to be here. You know, like they should know how much I'm giving up to be here. And then you're kind of silently brooding and upset about it. Um, 
and you just have to ask for what you want. And this really comes in handy in those meetings um, when you are trying to reach a, com like a commitment and everybody is like, we're gonna use NPM. And you're like, yarn is so much better. These people have no idea what they're missing out on, but you don't say anything. And so then you silently go along with the decision to use NPM and you hate it and you're upset about it and it affects like every interaction you have with the person that brought up NPM. You're just like, oh. <laughs> um, but even if you are in the minority and you just voice, come up and say like, I think yarn is really great because the NPM like shrink wrap just can mess everything up, especially for Windows users. It adds in these extra packages we don't need. Um, and I really think yarn might be the best thing in this situation. Everybody listens, but they still decide to go with yarn at, or with NPM. Um, but they honestly listen, they openly listen and you felt like your opinion was heard. And now, and it's out there, it's not on you. It's like a weight lifted off of you that you are carrying around the silent fact that you think yarn is better. Um, and so just letting that out into the world, it's not your responsibility anymore. Everybody knows how you feel about yarn. Um, so requesting that kind of stuff, um, even if you don't get it, it just, it just feels so much better to just ask for it. What's the worst that's gonna happen? Like, I just started a new client on Wednesday, um, and I knew I was speaking here on Saturday, and there was a hot minute where I was like, oh, it'd be so nice to just like get out of town, maybe I'll hop on a plane, maybe I'll ask if I can start on Monday. And I was like, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm speaking here on Saturday, only a three-day vacation, that's not worth it. Then come Tuesday, and the polar vortex is coming, I'm like, a three-day vacation would have been awesome. I would totally take that, and then I, was kind of going back and forth. They were like, well, it sounds like maybe they'll push it to Thursday because it's gonna be so cold, no one's gonna be in the office. And I was like, oh man, like I wish I would have just asked for those days off, this sucks. And then I knew I would have just gone into work and be like, you don't know how lucky you are to have me here. I could be like in Palm Springs, like reading a book outside and just like hold on to that anger and start, on, start a client on a bad foot. But I asked my manager, I was like, is it possible no big deal, like if you've already done the back and forth or if I don't want you to ruin your relationship with the client, but would it be possible to maybe do a start date of Monday? And he got back to me, he was like, well, we did do a lot of back and forth, they really want you to start as soon as possible. And I was like, okay, that's totally fine, but I had asked and I got that, like, that answer that was like, we did try and we did do this, I hear you, but they really want you to start. And so just the fact that I was able to ask and I got a respectful response, like just made me feel so much better. Um, yeah, so it's hard to ask for it because it feels really weird, but um, it all, it, once you start doing it, it feels good. All right, so we've gone through the four steps of nonviolent communication, and now we're gonna get into like the kind of stuff that blocks compassionate communication. Um, does anybody have any questions right now or any examples or anything to add? Yeah, your, yeah. Your, um, the observation with that evaluation, I think that that's actually really, I, I love that one. I, I've heard that from someone else too, and one thing I've tried to start doing is to actually say that to people, and instead of I feel or I think, which is usually our kind of de facto thing, like I, I feel that this is wrong, or I think this is wrong, more so say observe, maybe that isn't right, or whatever, just even use the <laughs> word observe, or I see that that, like putting that in there, that just drives the conversation more to just, I just noticed this is happening. It's like without judgment. Yeah. Um, like, with, and, and actually, you know, probably one of the best workplace examples of talking to my wife about it. So, mm -hmm. like, there's something she was doing, and it's like it was totally like I'm not dissing you because you did it. I just saw that you did that. So I don't know if you noticed you did that, that kind of thing, and it just totally changed the dynamic because I, it, I actually had I was ambivalent about it. So it wasn't even like, why are you doing that? It was mm -hmm. just you know you did that. So yeah. It was so that I, I love seeing that on the list. It's a good one. And there is a quote in the book I wish I could find. I, I mean, let me see if I can find it. Hopefully this isn't too awkward for you to watch me flip through a book. Um, so the Indian philosopher J. Krishnamurti, I apologize if I said that so wrong, uh, once remarked that observing without evaluating is the highest form of human intelligence. Um, 
And he says, when I first read the statement, the thought, what nonsense shot through my mind before I realized that I had just made an evaluation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's true. It's really hard, too, because you are, you are you. You have your opinions. You have your judgments. You have your values. And it is so hard not to impress that onto what you are observing. And so to take yourself out of that is a really, a really hard thing to do. Yeah. So kind of in line with what you talked about and also earlier in the presentation we, we had in the lobby. Mm -hmm. um, when it talks about alienating communications, you know, I found that even personally, I've done it before, uh, the nonviolent communication by not really either, not so much participating, but when you suddenly decide to do something different, like when you suddenly go into note-taking mode, mm -hmm. head down, not looking at speakers, and it becomes violence. I ended up talking to the person about it after uh, the perception was you're, you're ignoring them on purpose. Yes. You're not valuing what they're saying. They're taking the time to, to talk to you. Um, but that also, you know, I had people with different backgrounds, whether they're uh, might be on a, a spectrum or whether they just have different styles or different cultures. Mm -hmm. I think that that always needs to be taken into consideration because that can be tough to say. Like, if you always take notes and your head's always down, you'd be ignoring or you'd be turning people away for help. Mm -hmm. At the same time, that might just be the way you operate, and people need to understand that and getting that out initially. Yes. It really helps break down those barriers saying, you know, this is just how I work, this is how I learn, and this is how I process. Yeah. And so I think it is on the response, it depends on the situation, and it might be on the responsibility of the person that might be in the situation where they could see that and be offended. Like, if I cared, um, now I'm just thinking of this, maybe it's something that we should start doing as like speakers to just come in and be like, Hi everybody, so, like, thank you for coming, welcome. I am totally fine if people take pictures. I'm cool if you're on your phones tweeting, if you're taking notes, do it all. Like, do what you gotta do to get the most out of this. Maybe some presentation, like maybe some speakers are like, hey, you are gonna get the most out of this if you put all your devices away, put your notebooks away, just be present right here with the people that are you are surrounded with, you know? And so you kind of set that expectation right away and you explicitly ask for what you need. Um, so that might be something good too. Or if you're on a team um, and it's a more casual environment and you just have meetings, if you are the person that just like taking notes just helps you like be engaged in the meeting, maybe just right off the bat be like, hey guys, I'm super like into this meeting. I'm happy to be here. I'm gonna be taking notes. I am fully available for questions. I am in this meeting, but it just helps me to take notes to kind of remember where I'm at and stay engaged um, just so you kind of let people know where you're coming from too. And so it sets that expectation. Um, it's You commit to something and then people can hold you accountable for it. Being like, hey, you said you were gonna be here, you said you were putting away your devices, and it looks like you're on your phone right now, can we please put that away? So it's kind of like you're holding them accountable to their own standards. So it's not like, I don't like it when you're on your phone. We didn't discuss this before, but put that away, you know? It's a lot easier to respond to it if it's been discussed before. Yeah, is there anything else right now before we keep going? I'm like keeping my eye on the time right now. I think we're okay. Do you know what time this ends? 10.30? 10? Oh, I can keep going. I had a whole cup of coffee. I don't know if you guys can tell, but like I'll talk all day. <laughs> all right, so this part is really interesting too. I think this really digs into what we just discussed a little bit more kind of applies to your life a little bit more. So the communication that blocks compassion. So there's certain ways of communicating that can be kind of life alienating, um, that alienates us from our natural state of compassion. It's in our nature to want to compassionately connect with people. You want people to respond to you, you want to respond to people. And we have just learned habits and ways that kind of have separated us from that, especially in the workplace. We're not supposed to show feelings in the workplace, right? We're supposed to just, you know, separate, it's like leave your personal life at the door, do your work when you're here, and then get out. But I feel like times are changing and you can be yourself at work and you should be yourself at work because that is your best self. Um, and so being able to connect with the people you work with can really help you feel more at home in your work environment. Um, and so that alienating communication also obscures the awareness um, for our own thoughts and feelings. Uh, it, kind of, it kind of disconnects you from your own self. 
which is a huge part of nonviolent communication, understanding your own thoughts and feelings and needs. Um, and so that life alienating com like, uh, communication, which you'll see, it works internally as well. So there's that moralistic judgment that we're going back to with the evaluation. Um, so blame, insults, puts downs, labels, criticism, comparisons, um, diagnoses are all forms of judgment. And we all want to do it, right? We all want to put people in their boxes. We want to label everything. We want things to be black and white. That's like how our brains are able to just kind of figure stuff out. Well, is it this or is it that? Um, and sometimes it's just, it's none of that. Uh, so uh, those moralistic judgments right away are already um, separating you from other people and like cutting off that compassion. So those moralistic judgments imply wrongness or badness um, on the part of people that don't act in harmony with our values. It could even be like something like, you have bad handwriting, you know? Or just like, I have a hard time reading your handwriting. Can you please type up letters to me from now on? <laughs> something as simple as that, you know? Um, but also it can be, uh, especially like let's say PRs, like pull requests. Maybe I, you know, like if somebody is not as detail oriented as you are, you think that they are lazy or sloppy. Um, or, you know, like they are not living up to your standards of, um, of just making sure that they are using camel case instead of kebab. You know, something like that, who knows? Like, but you feel like they are just not living up to what your expectations are. And then we are, express our values and needs in this way of the moralistic judgment. You have bad, hand, you have bad handwriting, John sucks at soccer. Um, who's gonna be super open to having a conversation with that person? Sorry, I keep standing like this. I don't mean to block you guys off. Um, but who's going to be like, yeah, this sounds like a person I really want to talk to now and learn more about. Like, who's going to be into that conversation? Um, I, yeah, so, you know, it's just, cut it out. <laughs> um, I'm trying to make sure I, oh, this was another thing. Sorry, I'm kind of all scattered right now. So last night, again, at the speaker event, we were talking a little bit about this, and there's somebody who was a newer mom, and, um, she was talking about how her husband used to kind of get upset, you know, like everybody can use their kids to get out of work, be like, I have to leave early, got to pick up the kid, got to work from home, I have a sick kid, and you're just like, I don't have a kid, like, <laughs> why don't people care about me? Why can't I get out of work? I want to, like, I want to get off at five because I have a date with Netflix, so I am very busy and important. Um, and so that's another moralistic judgment, like, why is picking up a kid more important than going home to let your dog out. Like, why can't those things be the same? It shouldn't be like one or the, it shouldn't be like, okay, you can go pick up your kid because that's important. You have to stay late because you don't have any kids and all you have to do is let your dog out. Like, that's fine. can't someone else do that? So that's kind of like a moralistic judgment on there, assuming that kids are more important than dogs. And, you know, maybe in the grand scheme of things, like there's probably a lot more people that would say, yes, of course, kids are more important than dogs. <laughs> But to somebody who doesn't have kids and they have a new puppy or their dog is their life, their dog is their kid, I know plenty of people like that, like that would really bum them out if they felt like their dog wasn't as important as someone's kid. And then they would get defensive and spiteful and not want to be there. Making comparisons, this is uh, my forte. I am so bad at this, like I do it all the time, especially just to make myself feel worse. Um, I don't know if it's the internet, but I feel like it was like Theodore Roosevelt, the internet said this, <laughs> that uh, comparison is the thief of joy. And I think it is so true. Comparison sucks. There's no reason to do it. It is the worst. It is either gonna make you feel better than somebody or it's gonna make you feel worse than somebody. And if you already feel like you are better or worse than someone, how are you gonna have like an equal conversation with them? How are you ever gonna feel like peers? How are you ever gonna feel like they deserve your time or they deserve, or you deserve their time? Um, so compassion, or like the comparisons is, it's so hard. It already, it's, something, it's another one of those like um, observing with evaluation. It's already setting you up to fail. 
uh, if you are doing this before you get into a conversation or a relationship with somebody. And then the denial of responsibility. So I don't know if you can see this, it's like, I don't want to work, this is torture. And then the brain says, we don't have a choice. Sometimes you just have to do things you don't want to do. Heart says, you're oppressing me. And then brain is like, you're being dramatic. Dramatic, I've only just begun. <laughs> and I put this one up there because of what the brain says. You don't have a choice. Um, you always have a choice. You do have a choice. And saying that you have to do something or you are being made to do something takes that responsibility off of you and puts it on an external force. So it's like, not my fault, I had to do it, you know? And so I do that sometimes at work uh, where it was like, why, why did you submit this? Why are you changing this? I'm like, I don't know, someone, they told me to do it. It was in the, it was in the task, I don't, I don't know. Um, I had to do it to move on to the next thing instead of really fully understanding it and being like, well, we, you know, like, under, like being able to express why this was a choice that was being made. But saying that you have to do something um, indicates that you have no control over your actions, which you always do, um, even though it might not feel like it. But if you reframe that kind of thing, it, feel, it puts that power back into your hands, being like, I have to go to work. It sounds like it, right? You have to go to work. But you choose to go to work because you don't want to get fired, right? You don't have to go to work. Um, Exactly, yeah, there's like, and, there's, and there's a lot of stuff like that where it's like, I am still choosing to go to work because I like my house, because I like paying my bills, because I like my puppy or my baby, <laughs> and I want to keep them. Um, so reframing that also puts the power back in your court and makes you feel better about the situation. Be like, I am choosing to do this because I love my house. I am choosing to do this because this job is better than probably a whole lot of other jobs that I could be doing right now. Um, and so just reframing that helps out a lot. Um, or saying that someone else is making you feel a certain way. You make me feel guilty when you do that. Um, it's up to you how you feel. They might be the stimulus, like we kind of shoot back to that. They might be the stimulus, but they aren't the cause of your feelings. Um, so we are dangerous when we're not conscious of our responsibility, how we behave, think, and feel. Um, so a lot of war crimes, a lot of horrible acts that have been committed um, are because people say, I had to do it. I was told to do it. I didn't have a choice. Um, and so when we take that responsibility off of ourselves, uh, I feel like that lets us, that takes away our humanity a little bit because it's not, it doesn't feel like it's up to us which it always is. All right, I think I'm finishing like at a good point. Um, so summary, uh, I don't know. Like I had another slide up here that said uh, it was the Yeti from the Awkward Yeti. And it said, I have no idea what I'm doing. But I was like, maybe I should put something a little bit more confident up there. Uh, <laughs> but now I kind of wish I did have the one that said, I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I mean, I just, I really love this. I went to Prime Digital Academy and I learned about this through them. And it was just something that really spoke to me. And it was something that I started using in my personal life. And it made me just a better communicator. It made me feel more in touch with myself. Um, Cause I would never talk, I would never express my feelings. I would never ask for what I needed. And I was kind of unhappy about it. And I was just like the strong silent type being along like, very Minnesotan being like, I don't want to be here, but I have to be here and I will suck it up for the greater good. And I'm such a martyr. Like, this is my fight, you know, like just, you know, <laughs> not saying exactly what I feel and what I need. And then also I've been trying to um, work on this a lot more lately, trying to figure out how I feel. And it's really hard, especially when I'm like upset or you wake up on the wrong side of the bed. And you're like, why am I, why? Do I feel so unhappy right now? And trying to dig down and like figure out what the feeling is and then underneath that what the unmet need is that is causing that feeling, it's really hard. Um, yeah. What advice do you have for people who are here, obviously, mm -hmm. this they're like, I'm going to apply this to myself. Yeah. What do you do when your manager is the one who needs this information? How do you present this to your manager? Yes. 
Um, well, your manager, as, as much as it's, it, you know, like the bureaucracy tries to tell you they're not your peer, they're your peer. Um, and I had something the other day where, and it's, it benefits everybody if you're open and honest about it, and you just have to frame it in a way that doesn't incite this um, defensiveness, um, kind of like what we heard about downstairs, read it before you send it. Um, so like I had a situation where I had a senior developer comment on one of my PRs, and I made a change in one area of the code and it affected another area that I didn't check. He checked it, screenshotted it, posted it in the PR for everybody to see, and said, is this the desired outcome? And I was like, uh, I was so tempted to just be like, right on there in the public forum, be like, of course it's not a desired outcome. What a stupid thing to say. Like, why would you say that? Instead, I like messaged him directly, and he's, you know, above me. And I said to him, because um, we he we work remote or we don't work in the same building, so I don't know him very well, and we don't have like a back and forth with each other, so it's hard to know like how that was coming across. But it felt very attacking, um, and so I I told him I was like, hey, just to let you, I was like, of course that's not the desired outcome, and I was like, just to let you know, the way that you posed that comment, it really affected me. It really made me feel foolish. It made me feel um, just not as good as everybody and the fact that it was like in front of the team. Um, it just really, really bummed me out, you know? And I was like, I'm a newer developer. Sometimes I get uh, self-conscious about my code. I get self-conscious self about my skills. Um, so, I, you know, it's hard when we don't get to see each other every day. So I just wanted to tell you how I felt, you know, just in case you're dealing with newer developers or other people like that in the future. And then, you know, he was like, I had no idea, I'm so sorry, I apologize, and he went back and changed the comment on the PR and, you know, just said like, hey, this is happening, can you please change it? Um, and so just being open and honest, even if it's a manager or someone in a place of power above you, if you just express yourself and you show that vulnerability and you say, here's, when this happens, here's how I feel about the situation, um, without having any of like, you know, the uh, evaluation be like, you're a bad person because you do this and it makes me feel bad. Um, just kind of being open and honest about how you're feeling and then being, and then requesting something that might help the situation. Does that kind of, does, are you, is that something that you're looking for or are you no, looking no, for something I, more I mean, specific? I know how to manage it. It's more for like, yeah. what additional information based on is it addressed in the book? Is there any further guidance? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, that's another one, too. Like, I'm telling everybody to read The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I'm like, every time I meet somebody, I'm like, have you read The Five Dysfunctions of a Team? And if they say no, I'm like, you have to read it. <laughs> and if they already have, then we just high five and we're like, it's so good. Um, so there's no problem, like, suggesting to read this book. Um, uh, you know, it's something where it's like, if they're not communicating with you compassionately, you can try to lead the, the path and do it yourself. Um, otherwise, just doing as much as you can internally and just saying, like, here's what I need from you. Like, that is what a manager should be there for. You should be able to be open and honest with them and request what you need. And if they aren't giving it to you, you might have to go to the next person and be like, and sit down face to face because there is something about being able to speak to somebody face to face and be in the same room, breathe the same air, see the facial expressions that just helps really kind of circumvent a lot of miscommunication that can happen. If you're just human and honest about it and you're like, here are my feelings, here's what I need, hopefully they value you enough as an employee that they would at least listen and then hopefully help. I can share what I've done. Yeah. Um, so I have a community check with manager. And it's more about like, what am I doing, what can I improve on? And in one of those check-ins, I identify that the way in which I was being talked to Mm -hmm. And I asked if I could have a weekly check-in with them in addition, then I could spend my check-in talking about how I can improve, but then we also had an additional check-in where I talked with them about how they can improve the way in which they're communicating with me. And it was actually very, very helpful. Yeah. And we only did it a couple of times, but that was enough to set a standard and we don't have those issues anymore. Yeah, that's awesome. And I think that's super helpful because not only does it help you, it helps them. And I think we are on, you know, like I think that is 
one of the things about being a good employee is like you want to help other people too, right? Like when I think about these situations and like when I like when I talk to my senior developer about how that comment really hurt me, I wasn't doing it just for me. I thought that he deserved to know that too because I thought that was something that maybe that would help him in his career to learn that those kind of comments maybe save them for people you already have a like a, a history with that know that you're just like poking at them or you know like to make him aware of how those comments can affect other people to help him in the future so I think of it when I bring it up I'm not only helping myself I'm hopefully also helping the other person yeah so is there anything else I apologize if I was kind of like blah like all over the place I'm just super stoked this is so much fun <laughs> all right so please at me on Twitter. Uh, feel free to send me an email if you have any questions about Solution Design Group, if you have any questions about nonviolent communication, if you ever want to get together for coffee, I'm up for it. Board games, up for it. Um, thank you so much for being here and being an awesome audience. Thank you.